Okay, welcome to the computational complexity session of uh, IDCS 2021. Uh, Daniel, please. Hi, you can hear me, right? Um, thank you all for coming. This talk is on total functions in the polynomial hierarchy. This is joint work with my advisor, Christos at Columbia, Bobby Kleinberg at Cornell, and Oliver Corton at Columbia. So here is an overview of this talk at a very high level. Uh, in this talk, we're interested in function problems, not decision problems. So in particular, we're interested in FNP and not NP. So what is FNP? For example, think of the relation mapping satisfiable formulas to their satisfying assignments. Um, but of course, not every formula participates in this relation because there are formulas without satisfying assignments. So this motivates the definition of TFNP, which are those problems in FNP that are total. So for every input, there's going to be an output. And recall from intrinsic complexity that an NP generalizes to a polynomial hierarchy of classes sigma i and pi i. In our work, we generalize TFNP to an analogous hierarchy of total function classes of TF sigma i. And we identify natural problems and subclasses in this hierarchy. So briefly, um, a relation Rxy is total if for every x there's a y such that xy is in the relation. And TFNP are those relations that are in FNP and are total. So in this slide, I'm trying to explain to you why we care about TFNP subclasses. And you may have seen such subclasses before, PPP, PPA, PPAD, et cetera. So to show that a decision problem is hard or to motivate that it's hard, we show that it's empty complete as evidence. So to show a total search problem is hard, maybe we would show that it's TFNP complete. And we would like this, but we strongly believe there aren't TFNP complete problems. But TFNP does have many canonical, canonical and natural problems where we know a solution is guaranteed. So this problem is total, but we don't know how to compute one in polynomial time. Because uh, the reason we know it's total is some sort of non-constructive combinatorial argument or principle. So what we can do is then define subclasses by reduction to these canonical problems. And what that ends up doing is grouping total search problems by this non-constructive combinatorial principle that's in its totality proof. So that's what all these classes are doing. And then you can establish evidence of hardness for some new total search problem by showing it's complete for one of those subclasses. That's sort of the agenda. So here's an example. Um, consider the following combinatorial principle. Given a mapping with fewer outputs than there are inputs, there must be a collision by the pigeonhole principle. So here's a concrete corresponding computational problem. Given the circuit from n bits to n bits, either find a pre-image of the zero string, or if there isn't any, find a collision. This is in TFNP, and we define the subclass PPP as those relations that are polytime reducible to pigeonhole. But now consider this combinatorial argument, the empty pigeonhole principle. Given a mapping with more outputs than there are inputs, there exists an empty pigeonhole, and the corresponding problem empty. Given the circuit mapping two to the n minus one inputs to two to the n outputs, and the way we do this is just by ignoring the zero string as an input, find a y such that there's no x that maps to y. At very first glance, this looks somewhat similar to the pigeonhole problem. You might think it's in PPP, maybe it's PPP complete. But when you think about it, you'll see this is highly unlikely. I mean, maybe p equals np, but to verify a y, you'd have to check that every single pigeonhole doesn't map to this y. There's some sort of all quantifier at play. So this motivates the definition of TF sigma two, which are those total search problems that are in functional sigma two, but more specifically, they're total. And the verifying machine M is such that for X, Y in the relation, for all Z of polynomial length, M X, Y, Z accepts. And analogously, you can define a whole hierarchy of classes TF sigma I, exactly as how you'd expect. So this empty problem is in TF sigma two. And just how we define the subclass PPP, we can define a subclass PEPP, polynomial empty pigeonhole principle, as those total relations which are polytime reducible to empty. So PEP is some subset of TF sigma two. And you should think of PEP as those search problems where totality is guaranteed by the union bound, because the union bound is really a restatement of this empty pigeonhole principle. What does the union bound say? It says, if the total number of inputs isn't enough to cover some output space, then there must exist an element in the output space output space outside of the range um, of, the, of whatever mapping you have. So it's, it's the same thing. Um, and incidentally, we actually know that at, we prove that FNP is a subset of PEP, which we don't think is the case for TFNP. So this suggests that maybe these are different. Um, so we identify multiple natural problems in uh, TF sigma two, and in fact, in PEP in the paper, but 
I only have time to show one of them to you. So I'll show you the coolest one, I think, which is complexity. So one of the goals of complexity theory is to find a Boolean function on n variables with super polynomial circuits. And from an early proof by Shannon, which uses the union bound, interestingly, we know that almost all function, all Boolean functions require large circuits. Of course, we don't know of a natural one. Um, so this motivates a total search problem, find functions that require large circuits. So for this, um, given a bit string, bit string x of length m, we'll think of x as encoding a function on log n bits. And then we define an x oracle circuit simply as a circuit which has an x gate. This gate has log m fan and then computes the function x. So the problem complexity is as follows. Given x of length n, find another function with log n inputs that is not computed by any x oracle circuit with small enough size that by Shannon's union bound proof, we know that many of these functions exist. Okay. And this problem is in PEP. Now, there's something interesting about this problem. Uh, if you recall empty pigeonhole problem, you just have to have one more output that input and look for that output. Uh, but complexity actually doubles the output space at least. Uh, there are many unmapped to functions. So this motivates a definition of APEP, which is find at least find, find an empty pigeonhole given a circuit that at least doubles its input space. And I don't have time to define it to you, but we, another problem in APEP is delta rigid matrix completion, which has to do with finding rigid completions of a partially filled in matrix over some finite field. So both of these are in APEP and we show uh, in our paper and the proof isn't hard that APEP is actually in functional NP poly basically. And this matters because um, we don't think that this is the case for uh, PEP, for instance. So this might be some proper subclass of PEP. And so natural open problems are whether complexity or this rigid matrix completion problem are APEP complete. Good, now let's go one level higher on the hierarchy. Let's uh, think about TF sigma three. So let's recall what this means. The verifying machine M accepts XY um, if for all alpha, for all A exists B such that the machine accepts. So a question is, are there natural problems at this level of a total hierarchy? And I'll remind you that in the decisional hierarchy, the higher you go up, the harder it is to find nat um, natural problems. Um, but sigma three is actually one of the levels where, so, sort of one of the last levels where you have very natural problems. For instance, you have the decisional VC dimension problem is complete for sigma three. And analogously, the shattering problem, which has to do with finding large shattered sets is in TF sigma three. And the shattering problem can be thought of as finding certificates for the VC dimension. Um, so very quickly, a family of sets F shatters another set S. If for every subset of S, every subset T, you can realize that subset by taking some set in F and taking the intersection with S. And the sour shell alum, which is a fundamental result of finite set theory and classical learning theory, gives a lower bound uh, for the size of a shattered set. So this suggests a natural search problem given the circuit which implicitly represents a family of finite sets and a D that satisfies a sour shell, I'm up, find an S that's shattered by F with at least this size. And it's easy to show that this is in TF sigma three. You check that for all subsets, there exists a set, et cetera. But in fact, we prove in our paper, and this is a bit harder to show that shattering lives in PPP, which is a subclass of the first level of the hierarchy, TFNP, with a sigma two oracle. So here's a summary um, of this quick talk at a in one slide. So this is what was known before here, TF and P. We generalize this to a hierarchy of total function classes, TF sigma two and so on. In TF sigma two, we have the natural empty problem, which gives rise to PEP and other natural problems like complex complexity, which live in APEP, those which at least double the output space. In TF sigma three, we identify the shattering problem, which lives in an oracleized version of a subclass in TF and P. And of course, you know, for at every level, you have oracleized versions of every subset in TFNP. But the point is we found a natural problem in PPP with a sigma two oracle. In the long talk, I show you more problems. This is what you'll see in the long talk. And we have even more, there are more natural problems and more results in the paper. Um, so out of interest of time, I'll stop here, but these are some open problems. I've mentioned them in this talk as well. I also have a poem, which is on the next slide. I don't know what you want to do with it. Very nice, yeah. So, so let, let's let's keep the poems for the uh, 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 poetry panel at the end of the uh, session. And uh, Ishai, if you, if you can uh, share your slide. Daniel, I think you have to unshare your slide so Ishai can share his slides. Done. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, Shai, I think, I think you can go ahead and start. <clears throat> okay, thank you. So I would like to tell you about the complexity of finding fair independent sets in cycles. Suppose that you are given a cycle graph G and the partition V1 up to Vm of its vertex set. We are interested in an independent set of the cycle G that includes roughly half of the vertices of every part VI of the given partition. More precisely, we say that an independent set S of the cycle G fairly represents the partition if for every I from one to M, the number of vertices of S that belong to VI is at least half times the size of VI minus one. As example, consider this cycle on 15 vertices and suppose that the yellow vertices are those of the first set V1, the red vertices are those of the second set V2, and so on, every color corresponds to a set VI in the given partition. And notice that the highlighted vertices form an independent set in the cycle that further represents the partition. For example, we have here five red vertices and our independent set includes two of them, just as required. In a work of Aroni, Alon, Berger, Chudnovsky, Kotlar, Lebel, and Zill, it was shown that for every cycle and for every partition of its vertex set, there exists an independent set that fairly represents the partition. In a later work of Alishai and Munir, it was shown that if the number of vertices and the number M of parts of the partition have the same parity, then not only that there exists an independent set that fairly represents the partition, but there are even two disjoint such independent sets that together cover all vertices, but one from each VI. Looking again at our example, you can see that there is another independent set that fairly represents the partition. And together with the previous one, they miss only one vertex from each column. It's interesting to mention that although the statements of these results are purely combinatorial, their proofs are based on tools from topology. The first application of topology in combinatorics was obtained in 1979 by Lovas who proved that the chromatic number of the Knesset graph with parameters n and k is n minus 2k plus 2, where the vertex set of this graph includes all the k subsets of the set of integers from 1 to n, and two such sets are adjacent in the graph if they are disjoint. Lovas used the Borsuk-Ulam theorem from algebraic topology to precisely determine the chromatic number of this graph, and this result was extended and generalized in various ways. One such extension is the one of Scriber, who considered a subgraph of the Knesset graph induced by the collection of all the case subsets of the integers from one to n with no two consecutive integers modulo n. He proved that this subgraph has the same chromatic number and this subgraph is commonly referred to as the Scriber graph. It is denoted here by S of n and k. The proof of Aroni et al for the existence of an independent set that fairly represents any given partition of the vertex set of a cycle is based on the chromatic number of scribal graphs. Since these proofs are based on tools from topology, it is perhaps not surprising that they are not constructive in the sense that they do not supply an efficient algorithm with polynomial running time that given a cycle and the partition of its vertex set finds an independent set that fairly represents the partition. Understanding the complexity of such problems is the main motivation for this talk. So before describing the results, let me briefly mention a few related complexity classes. The class TFNP was defined in 1991 by Megiddo and Papa Dimitriou as the class of all the total search problems, those problems for which every input is guaranteed to have a solution, where the solutions can be verified in polynomial running time. In 1994, Papa Dimitriou initiated the study of total search problems in view of the mathematical argument that lies at the existence proof of their solution. He defined several complexity classes, each of which corresponds to a certain mathematical argument. One such class is PPA, polynomial parity argument, defined as the class of all the problems that can be efficiently reduced to the lift problem in which we are given as input a circuit that represents an undirected graph with maximum degree two, and we are given a vertex of degree one, and the goal is to find another vertex of degree one. Another class defined in this way is PPAD, which is a subclass of PPA that can be viewed as the analog of PPA for directed graphs. So it is defined with respect to a canonical problem known as end of line. And over the years, it was shown that 
PPAV perfectly captures the complexity of several search problems of interest. This includes, for example, the search problem associated with Sperner's lemma and the one associated with the Nash equilibrium theorem and so on. All of these problems are PPAV complete. For PPA, however, until recently, there were no known PPA complete natural problems, where by natural, I mean that their definitions don't involve circuits and Turing machines. But the situation was changed following recent results of Philos Lutzikas and Goldberg, who proved that several classical problems are PPA complete. And now we are ready to state the results. So we start by introducing the fair independent setting cycle problem in which we are given as input a cycle and the partition of its vertex set and the goal is to find an independent set of the cycle that fairly represents the partition. We show that this problem is PPA complete. We also consider the first splitting cycle problem where we are interested in finding two disjoint independent sets that fairly represent the partition and together cover all vertices but one from each VI. In fact, we consider here an approximate version of the problem with parameter epsilon where the two independent sets are required to cover at least half minus epsilon fraction of the vertices of every part VI. For the exact version of the problem where epsilon is zero, we show that the problem is PPA complete, but we also show that the problem is unlikely to be solvable in polynomial time, even for some positive constant epsilon, because for such an epsilon, the problem is shown to be PPA D hard. We finally consider the Scriver problem that corresponds to colorings of Scriver graphs. So here the input is a Boolean circuit that represents a coloring of the Scriver graph S of N and K using N minus two K plus one colors, which is smaller by one than the chromatic number of this graph. So the goal is to find the monochromatic edge. And this problem is also shown to be PPA complete. I would like to end the talk with one open question. So in this work, we proved the PPA completeness of the fair independent setting cycle problem. And it would be interesting to understand the complexity of this problem restricted to instances in which the vertex set of the cycle is partitioned into sets of size bounded from above by some absolute constant. More specifically, it would be interesting to understand the complexity of the search problem associated with the combinatorial cycle plus triangles problem that was introduced by Dusu and Wang and by Erdes and was answered by Flechner and Stibitz. This problem is closely related to the fair independent set in cycle problem where the vertex set of the cycle is partitioned into sets of size three and it would be interesting to understand the computational aspects of this problem. Thank you for your attention. Uh, great talk. I, I think we should keep the, the questions for the uh, uh, poetry panel at, at the end, but um, Ishai, if you can un unshare your, your uh, screen, then uh, sure. uh, next, next speaker, Benjamin can share uh, his screen. And, and if, if anyone has a very quick question. Okay, uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, wait, wait, we, we should all take a deep breath. Okay. Now we're ready for another talk. Go. Okay, um, so this talk is about um, understanding the relative strength of QPF CDCL solvers and QPF resolution, which was a joint work with Olaf Beiersdorf from um, University of Vienna in Germany. So what we basically wanted to do is we wanted to analyze QPF solvers um, or the, the power of QPF solvers in a theoretic way. That means we wanted to somehow find um, equivalences or separations between solvers and uh, underlying proof systems and somehow see how they work and why are they so strong or weak or whatever. Okay. So maybe let's start with uh, Z solving itself. Well, um, the most, I think the most widely used algorithm in set solving is the CDCL algorithm, which is just a conflict driven clause learning. Um, and although set solving is known to be NP complete, which is a pretty hard problem, we could say that these set solvers like CDCL really work very efficiently on, let's say, industrial instances. So, uh, of course, there are also 
uh, hard examples for CDCL, but most of the examples from um, from the industry are pretty pretty well done in SAT solvers. So we could ask the question: How strong are these SAT solvers then? Can we somehow measure their strength in a theoretic way, or can we somehow say uh, when uh, SAT solvers are hard, or when, when problems for SAT solvers are hard, or, or when they are not? Okay, and this was basically already done before. And what we did uh, is we extended this whole problem to the QPF level. So maybe you know that CDCL can be extract, uh, extended to the QPF level, which is then called QCDCL. It means it can handle quantified Boolean formulas and not, all, not only uh, propositional formulas. And um, well, the QPF problem is even harder because it is piece based complete. But even there, you could say that um, as in SAT solving, here also these QBF solvers work pretty well on these industrial instances. Okay, so what is CDCL? Well, I won't explain CDCL here. I, I have explained this uh, DPLL in the, the long talk. So CDCL is based on this DPLL, which is a little bit more easy, which is a little bit easier. And um, basically it just adds um, the class learning and non chronological backtracking. Okay, and both algorithms somehow rely on the proof system resolution, which is pretty well known um, and pretty well to pretty good to analyze. Um, well, one one result we or one thing we did in our work was uh, we wanted to formalize uh, at first formalize the CDCL runs somehow such that we can analyze them as a proof system would do it this way. So you could say a CDCL proof looks like the following. It consists of three components, you could say. So the first components are these T's. This is just a, a sequence of so-called CDCL trails. I will explain in a second what these trails are. And then you have these clauses C1 to CM, which are just um, learned clauses. So from each trail, you can learn some clause because it is called clause learning. And from each learned clause, you also get a subproof, a resolution subproof, uh, which you can directly extract from this uh, CDCL run. And all in all, in combination, uh, this whole CDCL proof really uh, contains all information you need. Okay, and what is a trail? Well, a CDCL trail T is just a sequence of literals that represents a CDCL run it's between two restarts or backtracking steps. Okay, so you can think of the following. It's just a sequence, or you could also say an assignment, um, where we have these P literals and these D literals. So basically these Ds are our decision literals, uh, which I have written in boldface here. And then we have these P literals, which are propagated literals by unit propagation, which is also pretty, um, a pretty important thing in this algorithm. Okay, so what do we know about CDCL and DPLL? Well, there's this correspondence between um, DPLL and tree leg resolution. And even more important, this correspondence between CDCL and resolution. So you can extract resolution out of CDCL runs. And now the question, what about the other direction? Can we somehow extract CDCL runs out of the out of a resolution reputation? Okay, and then we had the, there was a result about 10 years ago where they basically found out, well, CDCL and resolution are P equivalent, which sounds great. But that's one thing you could have to consider. Um, the CDCL model in this, in this uh, result here contains some non-deterministic elements. That means some things like decision-making really depends on the refutation. So somehow uh, when you look in the, the algorithm, the, the code, you have some line like um, choose some non-assigned literal and set it to zero or one. Okay, so you have a kind of a freedom here. And um, basically here you have kind of a non-determinism which you haven't in the real practice. So in practice, CDCL uses uh, 
fully deterministic procedures for decision making, like uh, for, for, for example, decision making or clause learning. And uh, two years ago, we had uh, there was this result from Vinyals where he found out that well, this deterministic version of CDCL is really weaker than the resolution. So we have this overview. So CDCL uh, as a partially non-deterministic system is peer equivalent to resolution and deterministic one is weaker. Now, what about the quantified level? As I said, we want to make the same discussion in the QBF case. And in QBF, um, you can extract so-called long distance key resolution refutations out of negative QCDCL runs. Okay, so you can, um, from resolution, you can go to Q resolution for the QBF case, and then you can even more extend it to this so-called long distance Q resolution. I think I will explain it in the long talk. Okay, um, so here then question, can we gain a similar ex equivalence as in the SAT case? So can we somehow say that QCDCL corresponds to Q resolution? Okay, and a result from 2016 said that the deterministic practical QCDCL is even weaker than Q resolution, which is not very surprising. So question, can we at least construct uh, as in CDCL, a partially non-deterministic QCDCL proof system, which can simulate Q resolution reputations. And uh, well, this was our first real result, you could say. Um, QCDCL and Q resolution are in fact incomparable. So we have uh, separations in both directions. So, well, when, what do, do we do then? Well, um, in QBF, the picture is a little bit more complex than in SAT. Uh, as I said, these both systems are incomparable. And um, what we do is we designed a new QCDCL model. So we changed a few things in there and we called this new model QCDCL. This is, just means uh, a searching order, no reduction. And we proved that this is really equivalent to Q resolution. Okay, so basically this result just states Q resolution and this new uh, slightly changed model is P equivalent. And we get this overview as you can see here. Okay, so um, this is, I think my last, last slide. Yeah, you can see this overview here. So DPLR corresponds to tree leg resolution, CDCL to resolution. We have um, incomparable systems for QCDCL and Q resolution. And with this new system, we have really um, a P equivalence to Q resolution. Yeah, and that's all of it. Thanks for listening. And that's a poem, okay. <laughs> so, so there will be poems in the, in the panel discussion after the, the talks, but yeah. let's, uh, we have two more talks first. So uh, uh, thank you, Benjamin. I think it's, uh, is Peter presenting next? So uh, whenever you're ready to share your slides. Excellent. Maybe if you have like a, a full screen mode, that might be better. Great. Ah, okay. I'm Peter. Uh, this is joint work with Pavan and Vinod. Um, we have a concept of completeness for multi pseudo determinism. Um, so, what we uh, mean by that is so there's some natural problems that if we could get a pseudo deterministic algorithm for these problems then we could get pseudo deterministic algorithms for lots of problems. So pseudo determinism, um, we're talking about function problems again here. Um, a pseudo deterministic algorithm for a function problem consistently outputs the same solution. So here's a little example. Um, this one on the right is pseudo deterministic because it 
outputs A on most random paths. All right, so there's been a lot of recent work on pseudo-determinism and we know pseudo-deterministic algorithms for like finding generators of cyclic groups, um, non-residues, polynomial non-roots, bipartite perfect matchings that recently got improved to um, arbitrary perfect matchings um, and uh, prime generation. Um, and it's also been considered in the context of like interactive proofs and streaming algorithms. We're going to be talking about approximation algorithms where you have some number that you want to compute and the acceptable solutions are within plus or minus epsilon of that number. And it's pretty easy to get an approximation algorithm narrowed down to one of two different values uh, by rounding to large enough in intervals. So this motivated um, Goldreich to define multi pseudo determinism where instead of a single uh, canonical solution, you have a canonical set of some bounded size. And you have an algorithm that lands in that set with this pretty good probability. And th this specific probability is actually pretty important because if you, if you have this probability of landing in the set, you can amplify it by um, running A a lot and taking the most common value. If you drop below this value, that no longer works and we don't know how to do amplification. So our completeness result is centered around this problem of estimating the collision probability of the circuit. Uh, what's the chance that you get the same thing twice in a row? So it's an approximation algorithm, so we can get it to be too pseudo-deterministic. And that seems to be a hard barrier going from two to one, because if you could make a pseudo-deterministic algorithm, then any approximation algorithm, you can make it pseudo-deterministic. Um, so a quick overview of the proof. Um, so we've got an arbitrary approximation algorithm. We'll make it too pseudo-deterministic. So we've got these two good outputs. Um, we see either A or B with a combined probability of 3 fourths. We want to eliminate one of them. So the obvious thing to do is to run A a whole lot and take whichever value is most likely. That's not going to help if A and B have roughly equal probability. On the other hand, you could try running the algorithm until you've seen both A and B and then just using some arbitrary rule to pick between them, like let's take the bigger one. This is going to have issues if one of these, you have a very low chance of seeing it. So we're going to use our collision probability estimator to tell us which of these strategies to pick. And since our collision probability estimator is pseudo-deterministic, we're going to pick the same strategy on a particular input every time. And as long as the strategy is okay for that input, uh, then we'll get a pseudo-deterministic algorithm. And we're able to show that if you can approximate collision probability close enough, then it works. We also show uh, two other problems to be complete estimating the Shannon entropy of a circuit and estimating the probability that a circuit accepts. Because uh, if you can do either of these pseudo-deterministically, you can get collision probability pseudo-deterministically. We also um, wanted to push it beyond just approximation algorithms. Our proof um, extends very nicely to um, any multi-valued function with a small number of outputs. So we talk about multi-valued functions where you have just an R, the output is an, can be in an arbitrary set of acceptable answers. And we talk about search BPP where you can generate um, solutions with two thirds probability and 
check solutions in a with like a BPP algorithm basically. So for multi-value functions, we showed that you can get any so any multi-value function that has like a constant pseudo-determinism algorithm, you can get that down to pseudo-determinism, assuming this uh, collision probability can be done pseudo-deterministically. And we've actually got that up to a, a polynomial, um, any algorithm that outputs a polynomial number of different values with very high probability. For search BPP, we got something even better. If you've got a pseudo-deterministic algorithm or approximation scheme, actually we need an approximation scheme here for acceptance probability, then you can make any search BPP algorithm fully pseudo-deterministic. Um, so there's a few things to uh, look at from here, like what else is complete? Can you do completeness in some of the other settings that pseudo-determinism has been considered for? Um, can you get a complete problem in search BPP? Because um, um, approximate uh, acceptance probability is not in search BPP because there's no way to check that you have a good approximation. Um, and can you prove something like this? And uh, that's all I've got. Thank you for listening. Very nice. Um, yeah, Peter, if you can unshare uh, your screen and uh, Alex can uh, share his. And one more talk, hang in there. We're, uh, we're doing great. And great talk so far. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but your screen disappeared. Yeah, but, yeah, okay. Now everything should be set up. Now we have everything. Okay. Uh, can I start? Okay. So yeah, I'll present this joint work with Dorita Haranov, where we show two combinatorial MA complete problems. So as you see in the title, the main subject of our result is about MA, and it is the randomized uh, version of NP. And to be more precise, we say that a problem is in MA. If uh, there is a polynomial time randomized algorithm that is given an instance to the problem and a proof, and should uh, decide to accept or reject. And you want that for positive instances, there exists a proof that makes this randomized algorithm accept with probability to one. But for no instances, no matter which proof is given to this randomized algorithm, uh, it should reject with high probability. We expect uh, MA actually to be de-randomized. So we expect MA to be equal in P, and this is supported by a lot of uh, widely believed believe assumptions, but uh, it's still a big open problem in co classical complexity theory. One possible approach to attack this problem is for instance, to pick an MA-complete problem and show that it is an NP. But a big problem with this approach is that uh, even if MA was defined in the 80s, for a long time, we didn't know any MA-complete problem. But then, in 2008, Brav Interhall, they showed that the stochastic local Hamiltonian problem is MA complete. Later on, we have seen other um, MA complete problems, but all of them, they uh, are defined using concepts of quantum computing. So the main uh, conceptual question of our result is uh, trying to understand if, uh, if there is a fundamental reason for all MA complete problems to be related with quantum or if it's just an accident and we have other natural combinatorial and complete problems. So in our result, uh, so we define two problems. So the first one is an extension of uh, standard constraint succession problems, but to another setting that we call a set constraint succession problems or set CSPs. The second problem uh, that we call uh, ACAC, it, uh, it it, it is related to finding clean connected components of implicitly given graphs. And I'll, I'll describe both uh, problems with more details later. 
And just to, to, to finish uh, stating our results, what we show is that first, um, this problem called set CSP is MA hard. Uh, we show a reduction from set CSP to ACAC. And finally, we show that ACAC is in MA. So putting all of this together, uh, we have that both ACAC and set CSP are MA complete. So now I'll describe a bit more in details what these problems are and uh, give some idea of, uh, or at least intuition of the proof. So let, let's talk first about ACAC. And here the inputs are, uh, is a graph, but the graph is not given explicitly. So we're given a circuit that on input uh, uh, um, on a vertice. And, and here we assume that the vertices are just n bit strings. And uh, if on, on this circuit uh, on input, uh, given an input as a number, vertex outputs the polynomial in neighbors RV. And on top of that, we have a, an extra circuit, another circuit, M, that, on, uh, that marks some of these vertices. So on input uh, V, this uh, M outputs zero if it's not marked or one if it's marked. And the problem that you want to solve is uh, deciding if there exists a connector component in this implicitly given uh, graph where all these vertices in this connector component are not marked. Or on the other hand, every set of, um, uh, of vertices are uh, far from being uh, a clean connector component. So for these, we need to have two uh, constraints. So we want that every set of, um, every set of vertices it's either, it, it either contains a lot of marked elements or it's far from being a connected component, meaning that it has a lot of expansion. So we show that ACAC is in MA and the verification procedure is very simple. So the prover first gives one vertex uh, of this graph and the verifier just performs a random walk uh, for polynomial minimum steps on it using, uh, using the implicit description that is given as input. And if at some point the verifier finds a marked element, the verifier rejects. For completeness, it's not hard to see that uh, uh, there exists a vertex that uh, the prover can send that makes the verifier accept this priority one because there is a clean connector component. So the, verifier, the prover can just give any vertex uh, on that connector component and the verifier never rejects. On the other hand, uh, for soundness, what we can show that uh, the properties that you have from no instances is that every set that contains only clean vertices, it expands well. And in this case, it means that uh, any random walk uh, starting from any vertex should find um, a, bad, a, bad, uh, a marked element with high probability. Uh, let me now switch gears to uh, this set CSP problems. So as I said, it is an extension of CSPs to, to a different setting. So let me quickly recall what CSP is. So we can think it as having an assignment and this is just a n-bit Boolean string. And uh, we want to this assignment to satisfy some constraints. And a constraint here, we can think just of a set of substrings on some bits of this, uh, of this assignment. And you want that uh, the, the, the corresponding uh, substring on, the, on, the, on, the set, on, on these bits uh, to be in this uh, set of allowed substrings, right? This is a, a different way of seeing set CSPs. Oh, sorry, set, uh, seeing CSPs. And for set CSPs, we just uh, extend this notion of assignment to be now a set of strings. So we have that uh, you, you want to find a set of strings that satisfy some uh, what you call set constraints. The set constraints are also a bit more complicated than simple uh, constraints. They, they're not only sets of strings, but these strings are organized in subsets. So here, for instance, you have uh, the first two, uh, th this set constraint is a first subset that contains two strings, 0, 0, and 1, 1, and a set second uh, set that contains a single tone a zero one. And then we, uh, for a, a set to satisfy a set constraint, we need to have two, two requirements. And I'll explain it about an example that is simpler. 
So we want that uh, first that uh, the substrings on each string of the set to be in one of the sets. And th this is very similar with standard CSPs. We just want that all the substrings um, uh, of, of the strings in, in S should be in the set. But the mo more important uh, uh, restriction here is that we want that all these strings that appear together in a set, they should come together in this uh, set, uh, like this uh, uh, assignment set. So for instance here, we have that one, one, zero and zero, zero, zero should be all together in this uh, set constraint because uh, zero, zero and one, one, they, they appear in this set, in the set constraint. And uh, as I said, so we're able to show that uh, these set CSPs are RMA hard. And the idea is that we can, uh, the intuition of the proof is that we use this set S to contain all the snapshots of uh, MA computation. And we use the constraints to put all possible, or like to, to ensure that all possible random strings are chosen uh, at the beginning and all, all, all steps of the computation are added to the set. Just to finish, I'd like to give some perspective. So using some, uh, the, the same results of uh, Haranov and Grillo that we had last year, uh, it is not uh, hard to see that uh, if you have a constant promise gap for set CSPs, then the problem is in, in NP. So we don't need randomness at all. So this implies that if you have some sort of set, C P, a set PCP theorem or a gap amplification for set CSP, then it means that you can show that MA equals NP. Uh, other further questions is showing that this gap to ACAC is also an NP or finding other MA complete problems for, uh, from our problems. And thank you for attention. I see there is uh, one raised hand. Um, maybe we can let Or ask the question. Yeah, so Alex, you mentioned that set CSP with constant gap is an NP. Yeah. And then one over poly is MA complete. So what do you think happens in between like one over poly log? Uh, okay, what I think is that everything should be in NP, right? Uh, I believe in the derandomization conjecture, uh, but- Maybe, to, I, I mean, like, do you think that, that showing that everything it just comes up to a threshold of one value is as hard as derandomizing? Um, so our technique, it, it finds out Maria, I think it's one of her log log. Okay, uh, we don't prove this, but I think that uh, you, you can push it a little further, but not too big. Mm -hmm. but, but these are just our techniques. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have other intuition about the other sets of parameters. Okay, yeah, thanks. I think it would be cool if, if there was just one value of epsilon that if you decide that one, you de-randomize. Um, okay, thanks. So uh, thank you for the speakers again. We're now in the uh, panel discussion uh, part of the uh, session. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to uh, send, raise your hands in the Q&A or chat or any of those. I also uh, asked the speakers, um, while you're thinking of questions, I asked the speakers to prepare uh, poems about their papers. So I'll, I'll let the, while you're thinking about uh, uh, questions, I'll let the, the speakers present the poems in, in the order. So st starting from uh, Daniel again, Daniel will present his poem. And if anyone has questions about any of the papers, uh, feel free to interrupt. Sure. Uh, so actually, Bobby wrote this, so credit to him. Um, the time has come, our author said, to talk of many things, of pigeonholes and shattered sets, rigidity and kings, and why some words are far from codes and gates are input strings. Uh, very nice. Anyone with questions? Or uh, Ishai, did you prepare a poem too? Is, is Ishai still on the call? While you're, while you're all st still thinking about questions, I think Benjamin also prepared a poem for us. Yeah, yeah, one second. Uh, 
Um, okay, yeah. Since um, this whole formalizing um, uh, 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 an algorithm thing pretty much feels like taming a wild animal, I just called my poem Taming the Beast. Okay, so um, we planned to tame the beast, a beast called QCDCL. It was done before with its ancestor that used to be a rebel. Having lots of optimism and filled with determination, we robbed a bit of determinism and fulfilled the equation. The beast is still out there, slowly losing its margin. It won't give us a nightmare knowing one day we will win. Yeah. I don't think I've ever been to an actual uh, uh, poetry session. What, what do people do between poems to, for the increased uh, drama? Is, uh, more more clapping? Uh, snapping. Okay, finger snapping. That's more appropriate. Thank you. Um, who, who's uh, uh, Peter, did you prepare a poem? Uh, I took the lazy way out and just went with a haiku. Haiku. Okay, great. It's basically just the title of the paper minus a few <laughs> words. I mean, when pseudo-deterministic is seven syllables, you don't really have too much to work with here. Fantastic. Uh, Alex, do you have a poem for us? I have one. Great. So, yeah. A computer, a computer is a proof in a dice and problems related to supplies. But if I see a further cat, just imagine I sweat, keep calm, we can prove it twice. Okay, I can, we can help you twice. Excellent, I see, I see a raised hand. Um, can, can we unmute the, the person raised the hand? I missed it. Yep. Yep. Hi. Uh, could you guys uh, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Uh, thanks. I just had a, uh, had a quick query in the uh, uh, scalability perspective uh, with respect to all the panelists. So I would uh, like to ask how do their algorithms scale in the uh, real empirical uh, hardware uh, uh, settings uh, um, with respect to the applications in the cloud. Well, I don't do algorithms, so I didn't do algorithms, so. Maybe Benjamin, do you have anything you can uh, say about uh, uh, solving QBF in practice? Uh, could you repeat? That, that, that. Yeah, uh, uh, scalability and uh, solving it in practice. Um, yeah, okay. So basically, in practice, we really need a deterministic model or um, a more. So if we want to analyze the practice models, we really need more deterministic models. And this one we had here are more, uh, they, had, they have too much non-deterministic elements in there. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 we can also have uh, some sort of uh, uh, approximations that can work on that too, with respect to higher dimensional cases. If we take it there, uh, uh, or some sort of a uh, stochast uh, uh, stochasticity that can be also applied if we extend it. Yeah, but that will lose its how do I say it? Uh, 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 a tight bound. But yeah, I think so. But I may be on a tangential uh, 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 thing here. But yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, what do you guys think about uh, uh, stochasticity and noise and some sort of 
अपर बाउंड और हायर डायमेंशन वुड लाइक टू गिव योर थॉट्स ऑन दैट um if 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 no one has any any good uh, insights on this question and another question that was uh suggested uh, of uh specifically in in the context of of uh, the third paper on, on qbf but what what are good uh, theoretical models for uh sad/qbf uh solving if if Benjamin or any, anyone has um insights on that Yeah okay so i could say good models would be models where we really have good underlying proof systems which we can analyze so um for example when we have qcdcl we know that we can extract these long distance q resolution proofs but we do not really know if this is the perfect way in doing it i mean maybe there's uh, there are some un other underlying proof systems that are somewhere in between so um we really need some sharp um, let's say sharp equivalences or sharp uh, simulations in this so um, yeah and also as i said um it has to be pretty much fully deterministic because every non deterministic in there is far away from the practice so that's a little bit problem because deterministic systems are far more harder to analyze because they are more chaotic yeah thank you benjamin there is a a question i'm guessing for alex um it's an anonymous question in the um q&a are the definitions of ma with accept accepting probability 1 and accepting probability greater than 2/3 for yes instances equivalent yeah yeah you can you can yeah you can assume it's one without loss of generality so yeah it's an old result i cannot cite it now who who proved it but uh, yeah it, it it's known uh, i i had a, had another question alex about uh what's a gapped uh, acac oh uh Yeah, I didn't get into these details, but uh, we show that ACAC is MA complete for like we have some parameters epsilon, and then uh, if epsilon is inverse polynomial, then this problem is MA hard, uh, MA complete. And the question is, if if you pick this parameter to be epsilon to be a constant, then what's the complexity of this problem? And this and, and this is just like the approximation of of of, of this ACAC, how how far it is. from being a clean connected component nice um so so great um if if anyone has more questions or or want to uh, keep discussing um uh feel free to to stay on the zoom call um the 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 other session is is there another session oh, there's a business, business meeting that's, that's starting now and uh, i i have to go to a, a, a child care uh, session so I'll, I'll leave you but uh uh thanks again to all the speakers and especially those who wrote poems <laughs>